poison bloom. Hey, ASMR. Hey, you. Who is it? I hope you're more than well. If you're interested in watching part one of this video, I'll leave a link somewhere on the screen here. And if you're interested in reading this book in its entirety, there's a link in the description box. The book is free and in the public domain. But let's move on and get started with part two of The Voyage of the Beagle by Charles Darwin. Chapter 15 Passage of the Cordillera At night we slept at a cottage. Our manner of travelling was delightfully independent. In the inhabited parts we bought a little firewood, hired pasture for the animals and bivouacked in the corner of the same field with them. Carrying an iron pot we cooked and ate our supper under a cloudless sky and knew no trouble. My companions were Mariano Gonzalez, who had formerly accompanied me in Chile, and an arriero with his ten mules and a madrina. The madrina, or godmother, is a most important personage. She is an old steady mare with a little bell around her neck, and wherever she goes, the mules, like good children, follow her. The affection of these animals for their madrinas saves infinite trouble. If several large troops are turned into one field to graze, in the morning the muleteers have only to lead the madrinas a little apart and tinkle their bells. Although there may be two or three hundred together, each mule immediately knows the bell of its own madrina and comes to her. About noon, we began the tedious ascent of the Pequenes Ridge, and then for the first time experienced some little difficulty in our respiration. The mules would halt every fifty yards, and after resting for a few seconds, the poor willing animals started of their own accord again. The short breathing from the rarefied atmosphere is called by the Chilenos Puna, and they have most ridiculous notions concerning its origin. Some say all the waters here have puna, others that when there is snow there is puna, and this no doubt is true. The only sensation I experienced was a slight tightness across the head and chest, like that felt on leaving a warm room and running quickly in frosty weather. I am told that in Potosi, about 13,000 feet above the sea, strangers do not become thoroughly accustomed to the atmosphere for an entire year. The inhabitants all recommend onions for the puna, as this vegetable has sometimes been given in Europe for pictorial complaints. It may possibly be of real service. For my part, I found nothing so good as the fossil shells. A great number of the plants and animals were absolutely the same as, or most allied to, those of Patagonia. We here have the agouti, biscaccia, three species of armadillo, the ostrich, certain kinds of partridges, and other birds, none of which are ever seen in Chile, but are the characteristic animals of the desert plains of Patagonia. We have likewise Many of the same, to the eyes of a person who is not a botanist, thorny stunted bushes, withered grass and dwarf plants. Even the black, slowly crawling beetles are closely similar, and some, I believe, on rigorous examination, absolutely identical. April 5th We had a long day's ride across the central ridge, from the Incas Bridge to the Ojos del Agua, which are situated near the lowest Casucha on the Chilean side. The road did not pass over any perpetual snow, although there were patches of it on both hands. The wind on the summit was exceedingly cold, but it was impossible not to stop for a few minutes to admire, again and again, 
the colour of the heavens and the brilliant transparency of the atmosphere. The scenery was grand. To the westward there was a fine chaos of mountains divided by profound ravines. Chapter 16 Northern Chile and Peru April 27th I set out on a journey to Coquimbo and thence through Guasco to Copiapo where Captain Fitzroy kindly offered to pick me up in the Beagle. The distance in a straight line along the shore northward is only 420 miles, but my mode of travelling made it a very long journey. I bought four horses and two mules, the latter carrying the luggage on alternate days. The six animals together only cost the value of £25 sterling, and at Copiapo I sold them again for 23 We travelled in the same independent manner as before, cooking our own meals and sleeping in the open air. The dress of the Chilean miner is peculiar and rather picturesque. He wears a very long shirt of some dark-coloured baize with a leathern apron, the whole being fastened around his waist by a bright-coloured sash. His trousers are very broad and his small cap of scarlet cloth is made to fit the head closely. We met a party of these miners in full costume, carrying the body of one of their companions to be buried. They marched at a very quick trot, four men supporting the corpse, one set having run as hard as they could for about two hundred yards, were relieved by four others, who had previously dashed on ahead on horseback. Thus they proceeded, encouraging each other by wild cries. Altogether, the scene formed a most strange funeral. Fourteenth. We reached Coquimbo, where we stayed a few days. The town is a remarkable for nothing but its extreme quietness. It is said to contain from six to eight thousand inhabitants. On the morning of the 17th, it rained lightly, the first time this year for about five hours. The farmers who plant corn near the sea coast, where the atmosphere is most humid, take advantage of this shower, would break up the ground. After a second, they would put the seed in and if a third shower should fall, they would reap a good harvest in the spring. It was interesting to watch the effect of this trifling amount of moisture. Twelve hours afterwards, the ground appeared as dry as ever. Yet after an interval of ten days, all the hills were faintly tinged with green patches, the grass being sparingly scattered in hair-like fibres, a full inch in length. Before this shower, every part of the structure was bare, as on a high road. In this northern part of Chile, within the Cordillera, old Indian houses are said to be especially numerous. By digging amongst the ruins, bits of woolen articles, instruments of precious metals, and heads of Indian corn are not unfrequently discovered. An arrowhead made of agate and of precisely the same form with those now used in Tierra del Fuego was given me. I am aware that the Peruvian Indians now frequently inhabit most lofty and bleak situations, but at Copiapo I was assured by men who had spent their lives in travelling through the Andes that there were very many muchísimas buildings at heights so great as almost to border upon the perpetual snow, and in parts where there exist no passes and where the land produces absolutely nothing, and what is still more extraordinary, where there is no water. July 19th We anchored in the bay of Calao, the seaport of Lima, the capital of Peru. We stayed here six weeks, but from the troubled state of public affairs, 
I saw very little of the country. During our whole visit, the climate was far from being so delightful as it is generally represented. A dull, heavy blank of clouds constantly hung over the land, so that during the first sixteen days I had only one view of the Cordillera behind Lima. These mountains, seen in stages, one above the other, through openings in the clouds, had a very grand appearance. It has almost become a proverb that rain never falls in the lower part of Peru. Yet this can hardly be considered correct, for during almost every day of our visit there was a thick drizzling mist which was sufficient to make the streets muddy and one's clothes damp. This the people are pleased to call Peruvian dew. Chapter 17 Galapagos Archipelago The Beagle sailed around Chatham Island and anchored in several bays. The day was glowing hot, and the scrambling over the rough surface and through the intricate thickets was very fatiguing, but I was well repaid by the strange cyclopean scene. As I was walking along, I met two large tortoises, each of which must have weighed at least two hundred pounds. One was eating a piece of cactus, and as I approached, it stared at me and slowly walked away. The other gave a deep hiss and drew in its head. September 23rd. The beagle proceeded to Charles Island. This archipelago has long been frequented first by the buccaneers and latterly by whalers, but it is only within the last six years that a small colony has been established here. The inhabitants are between two and three hundred in number. They are nearly all people of colour who have been banished for political crimes from the Republic of the Equator, of which Quito is the capital. The houses are irregularly scattered over a flat space of ground, which is cultivated with sweet potatoes and bananas. The inhabitants, although complaining of poverty, obtain, without much trouble, the means of subsistence. In the woods there are many wild pigs and goats, but the staple article of animal food is supplied by the tortoises. Their numbers have of course been greatly reduced in this island, but the people yet count on two days hunting, giving them food for the rest of the week. I have not as yet noticed by far the most remarkable feature in the natural history of this archipelago. It is that the different islands to a considerable extent are inhabited by a different set of beings. My attention was first called to this fact by the vice-governor, Mr. Lawson, declaring that the tortoises differ from the different islands and that he could with certainty tell from which island any one was brought. I did not for some time pay sufficient attention to this statement, and I had already partially mingled together the collections from two of the islands. I never dreamed that islands about fifty or sixty miles apart, and most of them in sight of each other, formed of precisely the same rocks, placed under a quite similar climate, rising to a nearly equal height, would have been differently tenanted. But we shall soon see that this is the case. It is the fate of most voyagers, no sooner to discover what is most interesting in any locality than they are hurried from it. But I ought perhaps to be thankful that I obtained sufficient materials to establish this most remarkable fact in the distribution of organic beings. Chapter 18 Tahiti and New Zealand November 15th At daylight, Tahiti, an island 
which must forever remain classical to the voyager in the South Sea, was in view. At a distance, the appearance was not attractive. The land, capable of cultivation, is scarcely in any part more than a fringe of low alluvial soil, accumulated around the base of the mountains, and protected from the waves of the sea by a coral reef, which encircles the entire line of coast. Within the reef there is an expanse of smooth water, like that of a lake, where the canoes of the natives can ply with safety and where ships anchor. The low land, which comes down to the beach of coral sand, is covered by the most beautiful productions of the intertropical regions. In the midst of bananas, orange, coconut and breadfruit trees, spots are cleared where yams, sweet potatoes and sugar cane and pineapples are cultivated. Most of the men are tattooed, and the ornaments follow the curvature of the body so gracefully that they have a very elegant effect. One common pattern, varying in its details, is somewhat like the crown of a palm tree. It springs from the central line of the back and gracefully curls around both sides. The smile may be a fanciful one, but I thought the body of a man thus ornamented was like the trunk of a noble tree embraced by a delicate creeper. In returning in the evening to the boat, we stopped to witness a very pretty scene. Numbers of children were playing on the beach and had lighted bonfires which illumined the placid sea and surrounding trees. Others in circles were singing Tahitian verses. We seated ourselves on the sand and joined their party. The songs were impromptu and I believe related to our arrival. One little girl sang a line which the rest took up in parts, forming a very pretty chorus. The whole scene made us unequivocally aware that we were seated on the shore of an island in the far-famed South Sea. December 19th In the evening we saw in the distance New Zealand. We may now consider that we have nearly crossed the Pacific. December 22nd In the morning I went out walking, but I soon found that the country was very impracticable. All the hills are thickly covered with tall fern, together with a low bush which grows like a cypress, and very little ground has been cleared or cultivated. I then tried the sea beach, but proceeding towards each hand, my walk was soon stopped by saltwater creeks and deep brooks. New Zealand is favoured by one great natural advantage namely, that the inhabitants can never perish from famine. The whole country abounds with fern, and the roots of this plant, if not very palatable, yet contain much nutriment. A native can always subsist on these, and on the shellfish, which are abundant on all parts of the sea coast. The villages are chiefly conspicuous by the platforms which are raised on four posts ten or twelve feet above the ground, and on which the produce of the fields is kept secure from all accidents. With regard to animals, it is a most remarkable fact that so large an island, extending over more than 700 miles in latitude and in many parts ninety broad, with varied stations, a fine climate and land of all heights from 14,000 feet downwards with the exception of a small rat did not possess one indigenous animal. The several species of that gigantic genus of birds, the Deinornis, seem here to have replaced mammiferous quadrupeds in the same manner as the reptiles still do at the Galapagos archipelago. It is said 
that the common Norway rat in the short space of two years annihilated in this northern end of the island the New Zealand species. Chapter 19 Australia January 12, 1836 I hired a man and two horses to take me to Bathurst, a village about 120 miles in the interior and the centre of a great pastoral district. By this means, I hope to gain a general idea of the appearance of the country. The extreme uniformity of the vegetation is the most remarkable feature in the landscape of the greater part of New South Wales. Everywhere we have an open woodland, the ground being partially covered with a very thin pasture with little appearance of verdure. The trees nearly all belong to one family and mostly have their leaves placed in a vertical instead of, as in Europe, in a nearly horizontal position. The foliage is scanty and of a peculiar pale green tint without any gloss. Hence the woods appear light and shadowless. This, although a loss of comfort to the traveller under the scorching rays of summer, is of importance to the farmer as it allows grass to grow where it otherwise would not. At sunset a party of a score of the black aborigines passed by, each carrying in their accustomed manner a bundle of spears and other weapons. By giving a leading young man a shilling, they were easily detained and threw their spears for my amusement. They were all partly clothed, and several could speak a little English. Their countenances were good-humoured and pleasant, and they appeared far from being such utterly degraded beings as they have usually been represented. In their own arts they are admirable. A cap being fixed at thirty yards distance, they transfixed it with a spear, delivered by the throwing stick with the rapidity of an arrow from the bow of a practised archer. In tracking animals or men, they show most wonderful sagacity, and I heard of several of their remarks which manifested considerable acuteness. They will not, however, cultivate the ground, or build houses and remain stationary, or even take the trouble of tending a flock of sheep when given to them. The woodland is generally so open that a person on horseback can gallop through it. In these woods there are not many birds. I saw, however, some large flocks of the white cockatoo feeding in a cornfield, and a few most beautiful parrots. Crows, like our jackdaws, were not uncommon, and another bird, something like the magpie. Chapter 20 Keeling Island Coral Formations I will now give a sketch of the natural history of these islands, which from its very paucity possesses a peculiar interest. The coconut tree, at first glance, seems to compose the whole wood. There are, however, five or six other trees. One of these grows to a very large size but from the extremes of softness of its wood, is useless. Another sort affords excellent timber for shipbuilding. Besides these trees, the number of plants is exceedingly limited, and consists of insignificant weeds. The list of land animals is even poorer than that of the plants. Some of the islets are inhabited by rats, which were brought in a ship from the Mauritius, wrecked here. These rats are considered by Mr. Waterhouse as identical with the English kind, but they are smaller and more brightly coloured. There are no true land birds for a snipe and a rail, though living entirely in the dry herbage, belong to the order of waders. Birds in this order are said to occur on several of the small low islands in the Pacific. At Ascension, 
where there is no land bird, a rail, porphyrio simplex, was shot near the summit of the mountain, and it was evidently a solitary straggler. Of reptiles I saw only one small lizard. Of insects I took pains to collect every kind. Exclusive of spiders, which were numerous, there were thirteen species. Of these, only one was a beetle. A small ant swarmed by thousands under the loose dry blocks of coral and was the only true insect which was abundant. Sunday, April 3rd. The houses of the Malays are arranged along the shore of the lagoon. The whole place had rather a desolate aspect, for there were no gardens to show the signs of care and cultivation. The natives belong to different islands in the East Indian archipelago, but all speak the same language. We saw the inhabitants of Borneo, Celebes, Java and Sumatra. After dinner, we stayed to see a curious, half-superstitious scene acted by the Malay women. A large wooden spoon, dressed in garments, and which had been carried to the grave of a dead man, they pretend becomes inspired at the full of the moon, and will dance and jump about. After the proper preparations, the spoon, held by two women, became convulsed, and danced in good time to the song of the surrounding children and women. It was a most foolish spectacle, but Mr. Leesk maintained that many of the Malays believed in its spiritual movements. The dance did not commence until the moon had risen, and it was well worth remaining to behold her bright orb so quietly shining through the long arms of the coconut trees as they waved in the evening breeze. Chapter 21 Mauritius to England April 29th in the morning we passed round the northern end of Mauritius, or the Isle of France. Although the island has been so many years under the English government, the general character of the place is quite French. Englishmen speak to their servants in French, and the shops are all French. Indeed, I should think that Calais, or Boulogne, was much more anglified. There is a very pretty little theatre in which operas are excellently performed. We were also surprised at seeing large bookseller shops with well-stored shelves. Music and reading bespeak our approach to the old world of civilization, for in truth both Australia and America are new worlds. May 1st, Sunday I took a quiet walk along the sea coast to the north of the town. The plain in this part is quite uncultivated. It consists of a field of black lava smoothed over with coarse grass and bushes, the latter being chiefly mimosas. The scenery may be described as intermediate in character between that of the Galapagos and of Tahiti but this will convey a definite idea to a very few persons. It is a very pleasant country, but it has not the charms of Tahiti or the grandeur of Brazil. May 9th. We sailed from Port Louis, and calling at the Cape of Good Hope on the 8th of July, we arrived off St. Helena. This island, the forbidding aspect of which has been so often described, rises abruptly like a huge black castle from the ocean. Near the town, as if to complete nature's defence, small forts and guns fill up every gap in the rugged rocks. The town runs up a flat and narrow valley. The houses look respectable and are interspersed with a very few green trees. I obtained lodgings within a stone's throw of Napoleon's tomb. It was a capital central situation whence I could make excursions in every direction. During the four days I stayed here I wandered over the island from morning to night and examined its geological history. 
My lodgings were situated at a height of about 2,000 feet. Here the weather was cold and boisterous, with constant showers of rain, and every now and then the whole scene was veiled in thick clouds. The chief food of the working class is rice with a little salt meat, as neither of these articles are the products of the island, but must be purchased with money, the low wages tell heavily on the poor people. Now that the people are blessed with freedom, a right which I believe they value fully, it seems probable that their numbers will quickly increase. If so, what is to become of the little state of St. Helena? On the 2nd of October we made the shore of England, and at Falmouth I left the Beagle, having lived on board the good little vessel nearly five years. Our voyage having come to an end, I will take a short retrospect of the advantages and disadvantages, the pains and pleasures of our circumnavigation of the world. If a person asked my advice before undertaking a long voyage, my answer would depend upon his possessing a decided taste for some branch of knowledge, which could by this means be advanced. No doubt it is a high satisfaction to behold various countries and the many races of mankind, but the pleasures gained at the time do not counterbalance the evils. It is necessary to look forward to a harvest, however distant that may be, when some fruit will be reaped, some good effected. If a person suffer much from seasickness, let him weigh it heavily in the balance. I speak from experience. It is no trifling evil cured in a week. If, on the other hand, he takes pleasure in naval tactics, he will assuredly have full scope for his taste. But it must be borne in mind how large a proportion of the time during a long voyage is spent on the water as compared with the days in harbour. The pleasure derived from beholding the scenery and the general aspect of the various countries we have visited has decidedly been the most constant and highest source of enjoyment. It is probable that the picturesque beauty of many parts of Europe exceeds anything which we beheld. But there is a growing pleasure in comparing the character of the scenery in different countries which to a certain degree is distinct from merely admiring its beauty. Among the scenes which are deeply impressed on my mind, none exceed in sublimity the primeval forests undefaced by the hand of man. Whether those of Brazil, where the powers of life are predominant, or those of Tierra del Fuego, where death and decay prevail, both are temples filled with the varied productions of the God of nature. No one can stand in these solitudes unmoved and not feel that there is more in man than the mere breath of his body. Lastly, of natural scenery, the views from lofty mountains, though certainly in one sense not beautiful, are very memorable. When looking down from the highest crest of the Cordillera, the mind undisturbed by minute details, was filled by the stupendous dimensions of the surrounding masses. There are several other sources of enjoyment in our long voyage, which are of a more reasonable nature. The map of the world ceases to be a blank. It becomes a picture full of the most varied and animated figures. Each part assumes its proper dimensions, Continents are not looked at in the light of islands or islands considered as mere specks, which are, in truth, larger than many kingdoms of Europe. Africa or North and South America are well-sounding names and easily pronounced, but it is not until having sailed for weeks along small portions of their shores that one is thoroughly convinced what vast spaces on our immense world these names imply. In conclusion, it appears to me that nothing can be more improving to a young naturalist than a journey in distant countries. 
it both sharpens and partly allays that wanton craving, which, as Sir J. Herschel remarks, a man experiences, although every corporeal sense be fully satisfied. <laughs>